Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's subconference, Winter Temperature Risk, Protecting Your Profits with Weather Insurance. Before we begin, there are a few technical details we would like to share. First, please note that all participant lines will be muted until the Q&A portion of the call. At that time, we will provide you with instructions on how to ask a verbal question. You are, however, welcome to submit written questions during the presentation, and these will be addressed during Q&A. To send a written question, please use the notes function on the lower right-hand side of your screen and address your questions to all moderators. In addition, you can adjust the presentation view on your screen by simultaneously clicking the control and the plus or minus button on your keyboard. If you require technical assistance, please send a note to the ATT CES operator or call our help desk at 1-888-796-6118. With that, I'm going to turn the call over to your webinar host, Stuart Brown, who is with Swiss Re Corporate Solutions Better Team. Please go ahead. Operator, thank you very much. On behalf of Swiss Re Corporate Solutions, I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar this afternoon, or for those of you who may be dialing in from over in the U.S. or not from Europe, uh, good morning, if that's the case for you. Um, I want to start by thanking Euroheat and Power. Euroheat and Power is the trade association of the district heating industry in Europe. And they've been cooperating with us in an outreach to get this message across to some of, uh, some of those of you who have shown some interest in it. So thank you very much for Euroheat. Uh, thank you very much, Euroheat. I'll put in a plug for Euroheat's annual meeting, which is going to happen this May in Glasgow. I believe it's May 16th and 17th. So those of you who have follow-up questions, We'll be there to take them there. As for questions, here's how we're going to do this. We've got about 30 or 40 minutes worth of presentation material to talk about. And then we've set aside the rest of the hour, that's about 20 minutes, for questions and answers. Now, don't let that stop you interrupting. I think there are ways to type in a question on the webinar. And when we see those coming in, we may field them at the time. My plan, however, is to go through the material and then wait for questions and answers at the end. I should also mention that the webinar is going to be recorded, and the link will be posted online on our website. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm here with Teresa Shorstein. My name is Stuart Brown, and together we're part of the origination team that originates weather insurance and protection for Swiss Re Corporate Solutions. Swiss Re Corporate Solutions is the direct insurance arm of the Swiss Re Reinsurance Group, and we have been in the weather business for about 20 years. That does business under what we call the environmental and commodities markets business, but what we do is to sell companies protection against weather phenomena. We pay people if it's too warm or too cold, too wet, too dry, too much wind, not enough wind. And we provide those products to people and businesses whose economics are affected by what happens to the weather. The fact that you're on this call means that you're probably among those. So let's go ahead and get started. I want to start by putting up a couple of pictures of what revenue volatility looks like in various kinds of business. This is Volkswagen. Okay, we've got this, uh, I see that we've got this a little bit uh, messed up. So, so in the middle of the picture, we've got Volkswagen. There we go. And you see a pretty steady particularly in the last five years, top line revenue around a particular level. What about different kinds of businesses? Let's look at a technology business. That's Siemens. Siemens is heavy equipment and technology of various kinds. And as you can see, their revenue line hovers around a fairly steady middle. What about something a little bit more economically tied? like the retail business. Well, what you're looking at now 
is the top line of Hennes and Mauritz, the retailers. And you can see growth there. But you see growth on a fairly steady curve. And then finally, Bayer, whose business is typical of the pharmaceutical business, again, fairly steady top line growth without a great deal of volatility around the top line. Now, these businesses have a lot of risk, and they use capital in different ways, but at least they're in businesses where they can count on, as a baseline from their position in the market, a relatively stable level of sales, a relatively level stable level of top-line revenue. Now, let me put up another example. What if your business looked like that? What if you had to deal with the difference between, say, 2012 and 2015, basically cutting your top line in half? Or what if you saw a great deal of growth between say, 2004 and 2010, and made some business plans based on that continuing, only to see those business plans deteriorate when the sales fell off in the following years. Most of you will have guessed by now what I'm talking about. That's right. This is an example of a company that's in the district heating business. What they do is to provide, as a utility, heat to households and businesses. And they have to deal with a business that has a top line that bounces around on a regular basis. It must be very difficult in that business to plan, to make budgets, and to do all of the things that you need to do to invest in a business and keep it sustainable. Now, it would be one thing if you had a top line like that, but your cost line was mostly variable. You could at least count on a certain amount of stability in your profit margins if you didn't have a large amount of fixed costs to deal with. But, of course, the business of producing energy is a highly capital-intensive business and is therefore carries an awful lot of fixed costs to cover. Many people who are in the business fund that with a great deal of debt. And so when the down years occur, such as we're talking about in, say, 2004 or 2014 and 15, that causes all kinds of problems it can cause problems with your financial stakeholders, like your banks or your lenders. But it can also cause problems for those of you who are producing cash to deliver to the rest of your municipal service needs. It can, do, it can cause all kinds of problems with delivering on those budgets. So if you have a business that looks like that, how do you manage around that? What if you could have volatility that looked a little bit more like this? That is to say, if you could count on, in some of those low revenue years, getting some compensation that would level that out that would permit you to budget and deliver on a budget or to plan for long-term investment in the business and to make, whether it's your cost of capital or just the feeling that your stakeholders have about your business, to make that a lot more stable. Now, we wondered how much does this matter to people like yourselves who are in the district heating business. So Euroheat put out a survey to all of you and asked a few questions. We asked, first of all, 
weather risk. Is that an issue for your business? Because, of course, most of you will have figured out by now that what I'm talking about when I'm talking about top-line volatility, what I'm talking about is temperature. If you are selling heat to keep people's houses warm, then you're going to have a lot lower sales in a warm winter. So, yes. Many of you said weather risk was an issue for your business. We, then we asked if it were possible to manage that risk, if there were instruments in the market that would help you get rid of that problem or mitigate that problem, would that be interesting? And a majority of you said yes to that. So what we conclude from that is that there's quite a few of you out there who have some interest in solving this problem and may or may not know how to do it. What we have in mind for the next 30 or 40 minutes is to talk about how to think about that weather risk, how your business might be able to benefit from doing something about it, and how you would go about fixing that, because what we do is sell insurance protection products that do exactly that. I'm showing on the next slide a little schematic that reminds you all of what temperature means to your business. If what you're doing is selling warmth in the winter or cooling in the summer, temperature is your demand. I don't need to go into complicated correlation analysis to explain or to talk about the fact that temperature drives demand in the kinds of businesses that we're talking about. It's intuitively obvious, and depending on how close you are to the retail side of the business, things like households or small businesses or state heating for industrial, uh, industrial and commercial installations, you know that there's a very tight coordination. There's a very tight fit between how much you sell, how much revenue you have, and what the temperature is. Now, you can't manage that temperature. There's nothing that you or we or any of us can do about that. But what you can do is to manage the financial impacts of that weather. If you have a way of getting compensated when the weather goes against you, then you have a tool that you can use to address all of those problems that that top-line volatility creates in your business. There's a picture on this page of the history of winter severity in London. Most of you are familiar with what a heating degree day is. And I won't go into that, um, or I'll go into that for those of you who aren't in a little bit. But the picture that you have, the line graph shows for the last 55 years or so how volatile winter is and has been historically in London. Heating degree days is a scale that moves up when it's cold, so that means a lot of demand for heating and down when it's warm. Look at the extent to which that's bounced around going back. Look at the degree to which, over time, that is getting warmer. That's climate change brought home to all of us. Look at how much more volatile it seems to be getting in recent years. So it's no wonder that 65% of the people who came back in our survey said, actually, if there were something that we could do about that, we'd be interested in it. We sell products, we sell insurance and protection that does exactly that. Can I go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, let me take a couple of minutes and talk about how you measure in an aggregate way the severity of weather. Most of you know this, but I'll just take a couple of seconds. 
the common language is heating degree days. What's a heating degree day? A heating degree day is simply the difference between today's average temperature and 18 degrees Celsius, if negative. Today in London, it's a pretty warm day for the end of March. I would guess that our average temperature is going to come out today at about 12 or 13 degrees. That means that today we have five heating degree days. Now, if you count that up, every day and aggregate it over the course of a month, then you've got a way, an objective and transparent and measurable way to express how warm or cold a winter has been or to express how much demand or how little demand there is for your heating product and your heating services. We use heating degree days in the business because it's a good approximation for sales. It goes in the same direction as demand for your product. It goes backwards from temperature, and that's important to keep in mind, but it goes in the same direction as your top line. Now, can we go back a page? There we go. If you have an index that does that, measures objectively how much demand there is in your business, then you have half of what you need to create the kind of weather protection that we're talking about. The other half is a settlement formula that expresses what happens when you go above or below the trigger point that you pick on that index. So if you have a heating degree day index that if you are below the average temperature by a considerable amount and that causes financial pain for you, then you want, what you want is a product that responds to that with compensation when that pain point is hit. Let's go on to page 9. Again, this is a, another illustration of how the trend is working in London, but let's look a little bit more closely at some of those years, 2003, 2007, 2012, 2016, the warmest winter start in London on record. What you want is something that levels out those bars or at least sets a level below which those bars can't go. Again, we're not talking about affecting heating degree days itself. That's affecting the weather. We can't do that. What we can do is use those two elements I described a couple of slides ago, the index and the settlement formula, to create a financial protection that does the equivalent of saying, I know it's warm outside, but my business is behaving as if winter was normal. So let's talk about how that protection works. Let's start with a grid that expresses what your revenue is on one axis and what temperature is on the other axis. We've already introduced HDDs, or at least refreshed your memory about what HDDs are and do. Low HDDs mean warm. High HDDs mean cold. So hypothetically, let's say that you have an unmanaged exposure in your business. Roughly, your revenue line the top line is going to respond to that warm and cold axis by having higher revenue when it's cold and much lower revenue when it's warm. Let's further suppose that you have a revenue target 
that we've shown is the horizontal line. Let's say that you've got a budget that you need to deliver, whether that is providing a subsidy for the rest of your municipal services or getting enough cash flow to pay your fixed costs or getting enough cash flow to pay out a regular stream of dividends to your stakeholders and maintain capital spending requirements. All of you do this every year. You make plans for what your revenue needs to look like over the course of a winter. Let's say that you wanted to put a floor at a level equal to your budget. You wanted to keep the upper end of that revenue curve. So in other words, you like the benefit of higher earnings when it's cold, but you don't want them to go below a certain level. What you put into place is something which, at a level that we call the strike, gives you a payoff when the outcome of a winter or a season is lower in HDD count, that is to say warmer, than what you're counting on. So it would be a product with a payoff that looks like that dotted green line. The dotted green line, and for those of you who are familiar with how options work, this is just a hockey stick option diagram, but it's a payoff that relates an insurance product to a level of warmth or cold severity relating to winter. And what happens with this product is that when you get to a point on the scale that's below that strike, you start receiving from the insurance product. And you receive in the amount that we've shaded as green in the diagram. The result is that you end up with an anticipated level of revenue that if winter is cold, is high, but if winter is warm, stays at a stable level. So let's talk about mechanically how that works. This is an example of how this insurance is applied for somebody whose exposure is at London Heathrow Airport, somebody here in the UK. The average winter at London is about 1,700 heating degree days. So let's say in our notional example, the utility in question has decided that anything below 1,600 heating degree days is bad news for their business. This is a product that they could put into place for doing something about that. You would have a strike, you would have it struck at 1,600 heating degree days. You'd have a payout formula that's expressed here on the page as the difference between the actual and that 1,600 degrees, if it's positive, times the amount that you decided to pay out or you decided that you need per heating degree day. And in this example, my insurance buyer has decided that for the size of his business, he needs to be paid 10,000 euros per heating degree day over the course of the November to March season to a limit of about 1 million euros, okay? So that's the nature of the product. It's insurance against low heating degree days calculated at the end of the season and measured against a floor or a strike 
or what insurance term, in insurance terms you'd call an attachment point of 1,600 heating degree days. For those of you who are uh, arithmetic minded, let's see, that's about 113 heating degree days below normal, warmer than normal, and oh dear, how many days between November and March? That's about, that's about 151. So that means that you're looking at a pain point that's about two-thirds of a degree below normal on average every day for the entire heating season. Okay, so now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but for that to happen over the course of a whole winter is quite a big difference in terms of revenue because that's the amount that you'd lose versus what you expected day after day after day. So let's talk about how we would calculate the payout. We're going to get to the end of the season. We're going to get to the end of the season and we're going to look at how many heating degree days there actually were. And in my example, we're going to count that up. And it was actually warmer than two-thirds of a degree per day on average above normal in the course of this winter. Let's say that the actual heating degree day count is 1,479. Got a little typo there. It's actually 1,479. Remember that we are attaching this insurance product. We're striking it at 1,600 degree days. So our payoff is that 1,479 heating degree days. That's below the 1,600 heating degree days by 156 heating degree days. So what you're going to see is a payoff of 156 heating degree days times that 10,000 euros, and that's going to be a total payout of 1,210,500 1, euros. Why is that? That's because that was the limit of the product. That was the top end. If the limit specified for the product had been higher, then what you'd see would be that 156 heating degree days times 10,000 euros per heating degree day or 1,580,000 euros paid out to compensate for the loss associated with that. That kind of product attracts a premium of about 280,000 euros. And when it settles, the settlement happens automatically. We simply calculate at the end of the heating season what those numbers were. We take the data reported from National Weather Services or from National Weather Services through a data provider. And we'll talk about data providers a little bit later. And we simply make that calculation and you get compensation without any need for a claim process, without any need for proof of loss in a matter of days. If you had had this product in place over the last 10 years or so, what you'd get is the payouts descri described in the lower right-hand corner on the bar graph. You'd see that in winters that had been very mild or even slightly mild, you would get some kind of recovery, some kind of compensation. 
make up for the revenues that you don't get from selling power. So the question is, in something like this, if that's what you want to do, if you want to put a floor on the losses that you'd have or the damage to your revenues that the temperature causes, how would you think about doing that? Well, you're going to look at what the long-term average is, and you're going to think about how have I budgeted, how have I planned for this coming heating season, and you're going to think about the volatility of that product. One way to think about that is to note that in a normal distribution, one standard deviation away gets you down to a somewhat lower attachment point, a somewhat lower pain point. So you could design a product or you could buy a product that would cover your risk about to that level. And you'd go through the exercise of figuring out how much that would cost and what it was worth and decide whether or not you buy it. One standard deviation away is not a great deal uh, of distance. That's not a lot of risk. You're going to hit that approximately one year in three or four. So another way to think about it is to just look at the very severe winters, the ones where you really fell short of the target, and by your protection, based on a much lower HDD count, that is to say a much warmer winter, and that is obviously going to save you something in premium, lower risk, lower cost. Now, everybody's going to think differently about where those pain points are and what kind of compensation you need to shield your business against that risk. And that is the art, if you will, of structuring a product like this. And we do a lot of work with clients helping them think about what is your hedging strategy? What is it that goes wrong when you have very poor top-line results. Or put differently, what could you do with the business in terms of investment, in terms of planning, in terms of other things that you want to do, in terms of your political position in your government, because many of the people who do this are municipally owned, and so what they care about is the reaction of stakeholders such as rate payers or rate regulators to things like warm winter volatility. What is it amongst your stakeholders that you need to protect against? What could you do with the business if you didn't have to worry about this kind of risk? And you have to balance that against the cost of the product. Now, this is an example of someone who essentially wants to put a floor on the downside of the business that they're managing. What if instead you wanted to fix it? That is to say, you really wanted to have a fixed level of revenue that you could count on and you didn't care as much about the benefits to your business of the higher levels of revenue. You were willing to give up that upside. Again, that may be something that you get no political reward for. If you can deliver on your plans and on your budget, that's all you need to think about. Or if you're getting your capital from investors and public sources, what you care about is volatility. So suppose what you wanted to do is not just protect against the downside, 
but really get that volatility out of the results of your business. Well, I've put up a diagram here on page 11 of a swap. Instead of what we did in the previous example, which is to say below 1,600 degree days, you start getting paid. What if instead we said, let's just fix that level at 1,600 degree days. Then if the temperature is below, sorry, if the HDD count is below, so the temperature is warmer than those 1,600 degree days, you'd get paid, just as you did in the previous example. But if it were higher, temperature colder, HDD higher, then you would get, you would pay the protection seller. You'd pay the insurer in this case. And so you've created the upside that you get, which you may not value as much, depending on who your stakeholders are and what they're interested in. You've created that upside for protection on the downside at a considerable savings in premium. In fact, it's not uncommon in our business to see those transactions set up without any premium cost at all. We simply build the economics into where we and the client agree on the strike level. So there's a simple couple of very simple examples of risk management strategies that you can carry out with simple temperature products based on the temperature index of heating degree day. Let's just go back and recap. I want to go to page 15. Let's just go back and recap what kinds of questions you need to think about as you're thinking about specifying this product. Which direction is your risk? Do you get hurt when it's warm in the wintertime? Or do you get hurt when it's cold in the wintertime? Because for some of you, a big jump in demand with a cold winter means extra costs for fuel that you may or may not have provision for adequately. And you might have to make up that difference at a cost. So sometimes there's a commodity price risk associated with these kinds of problems. So which direction is your risk? Is it warm or is it cold? Secondly, what's your pain point? Where does it hurt? When does it start to hurt? When do you start to be at risk of missing a budget target, of missing something that you need for cash flow for debt, of getting in the way of a long-term capital spending or building project? Where does that kick in? Then you want to think about, all right, if that's my pain point, what happens when that pain point is hit? That is to say, what does my payoff, what does my compensation formula need to look like? For some of you, that's a very simple linear relationship. In the example that I used earlier, that's exactly what we were talking about. 10,000 euros per unit or tick on that index. But sometimes the relationship is more complicated. After all, at the extreme, warm or cold is not related in a straight line to compensation of heating. Most of the time it looks like an S-curve. And so maybe what you want is compensation that is related to that S-shaped curve. That is to say, at a certain amount of warmth, it just flattens out. You don't start losing sales indefinitely. You also want to think about how large a protection product you want to put into place. How much total compensation do you need for this? And that's going to be a function of what it costs and what your needs are and how that trade-off balances out.
Before I start letting you have questions, let me just describe a couple of other variations on the risk exposure that we see people looking to manage and the kinds of products that respond to that. Sometimes your risk is a cold winter, not a warm winter. As in, what happens to your rate payers when their bills go up? And is there something that you'd like to be doing that helps you mitigate that, that helps ease that burden for them? What if you're worried about summer, not winter? You're in the south of Europe, and what you worry about is air conditioning load. That's emerging more and more as seasons get warmer, and more and more European utilities in the south of Europe are looking actively at these hedging products. What if what you want to do is protect your profit margins? Well, then you need to think about not just the volume of sales that comes with temperature, but the cost in excess of what you've hedged of the gas input or power input that make up your operating margins, that contribute to your operating margins. We write a lot of product where we make a calculation for a swap every day or an insurance product every day that calculates the difference between the expected temperature and that day's temperature and a fixed level of gas prices and that day's level of gas prices and make a pay or receive calculation based on how badly that hurts or helps the counterparty in our transaction. And utilities and other clients use that to get rid of volatility, not necessarily in top line, but to get rid of volatility in operating profit over the course of a season. And they pick up the benefits in financing and running their businesses associated with that. Now, I'm going to stop the presentation there and open up for questions. So I believe I'm to ask the operator um, what questions people have that we'd like to spend the next 15 minutes talking about. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, as we move into Q&A, please feel free to place yourselves in the question queue by dialing pound, number, numeral, or hashtag 2 on your telephone keypad. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted, at which point please then state your name and question. You can, of course, send in written questions using the notes function on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Please remember to send notes to all moderators. Standing by, let me start out with a written question that's come in. And that's about, what about weather data? Where does it come from and how reliable is it? Very good question. It's extremely important that the integrity of this product is trusted and is known. And so for that reason, our industry has evolved to using services that take National Weather Service data and essentially scrub it. They look for anomalies. They look for dropped readings and use algorithms that, in effect, patch those holes in weather information. And so, generally speaking, we've got um, very reliable and reliably clean sources of weather data for most of the locations where there are significant amounts of population. I use airports as an example here. Airports are great because they've been collecting weather data for a long time, 
but there is a lot of weather data that comes from other stations. And the map is pretty well covered by data that's reliable and cleaned and accepted by everybody in the market. Somebody who gets into using these products will need to do a little bit of due diligence around that. But that's an important piece of what we do in the weather business. Other questions, operators? Uh, we don't have any verbal questions, but we did receive a couple more written questions. How does your cost price compare to available hedges in the gas market? I think the way I'd answer that is to say that uh, is to say two things. Um, those of you who know how spreads work in the gas market. Um, will appreciate that for temperature products, which tend to have more volatility, tend to have more risk to cover than gas price volatility, not always, but frequently. Um, our, the weather industry's margin for taking that volatility tends to be a little bit higher than margins in the, in the gas business. There's also more liquidity in traded gas than there is in traded temperature products. So I hope that at least addresses the question a little bit. Okay. And the next written question that we received is, is there any more information about the premiums you have to pay for the products in more detail? Certainly there is. What I'd suggest is um, you, can you can go at that a couple of ways. If, if you could email the question to us um, and give us an address that we can respond back to, uh, we'd be happy to give to build out a little bit more information and give you a little bit more color around that. Okay. And the next question we got was, in the case of a product where the payoff depends on weather anomaly, and the gas price volatility, what kind of underlying gas products do you offer in Europe? Um, we offer products that represent or that reference both temperature at whatever location makes sense and gas at the major hub. We've written products that references NBC in the UK, TCF or NCG in continental Europe, um, the Italian gas index, uh, gas indices in France as well, um, pretty much anywhere where there is a discoverable forward price and um, some liquidity and transparency, those lend themselves well to uh, the gas product. Okay. Next. Uh, next question, if your margin is higher, I do not see what the benefit is to gas market. Versus the gas market? You can't hedge volume in the gas market, or you hedge gas prices to a known volume. You can't hedge top line temperature risk. No, that's not fair. Let me say that, let me say that a little differently. The way the, there are tools that can be used to hedge that risk in the gas market. Um, the kind of two-factor products that we're talking about can also hedge risks or can compete with storage, which gives you flexibility um, with gas versus gas. They compete with flexibility in a gas contract. Um, so these kinds of temperature-driven products are just another tool that you'll want to look at when you're looking at your hedging options. Sometimes they are competitive with trade hedging of gas. Sometimes they're competitive with some of the other volume flexible parts of the market, um, and sometimes not. But you'll really want to look at this as a choice if your risk managers want to make sure that you've sampled all the ways that you can manage this risk. I think we have a few more minutes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have another uh, question. In Germany, we distinguish a fixed price element and a variable price element in the district heating pricing. So if you choose the ratio is 
correctly chosen, the weather risk can be covered by that. Uh, the question is, in this case, do you think insurance is necessary at all? The answer is, with that amount of information, I don't really know. Uh, but when you say that there is a variable price, sorry, a variable element to the, uh, to the price, that may or may not have limits. So what this product could address is risk that is that sits on top of that uh, that variable variable price um, variable price protection. But you're right. If you have something that fully hedges, that fully manages your volume risk and the associated price risk, um, then this is not something that will add value to that, or it will add value only possibly on price. There are times when we've seen temperature-based products be more competitive to physical or to um, financial gas-only products. Okay. Uh, next question. What kind of products covering weather and market risk especially gas markets, would you quote? Could you quote? Sorry. Uh, we would quote, uh, um, we would quote uh, swaps. We would quote options, various combinations thereof. Um, the way, one way to think about this is just think about a quadrant where you've got lower than expected temperature, and lower than expected gas prices, lower than expected temperature, and higher than expected gas prices, higher than expected temperature and low gas prices, higher than expected temperature and higher than expected gas prices. Each of those four quadrants has a different impact on your business, and we write products that will address any of those four, combinations of those four, and we'll write those four terms anywhere from a month at a time, even a week at a time, out for a whole season, or even out multi-year. Got a few more minutes. Is there anything else? Uh, I'm not showing any further questions at this time. Okay. I've got, I, I see one that's come in. Um, which is how commonly used are these products across Europe? Um, and the answer is more and more commonly all the time. In our business, six or seven years ago, we were probably trading with half a dozen at most European utilities. Now it's more like 20 or 25, and the number is growing uh, every year. And if that's all we have, the only thing that remains is to remind you that um, in Glasgow, the Euro Heat and Power Congress is convening the 15th, 16th, and 17th of May. Sarifa and I will be there, stand 503, and we're making some presentations there. So by all means, get in touch between now and then, and we can address your questions. Um, give us a call and we'd love to set up uh, a time to meet when you're there. And with that, thank you very much from Swiss Re Corporate Solutions and from Euro Heat and Power. All right. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you all the audience for joining us today. The call has concluded and you may now disconnect.